I'm Fiona Hollins from here at Teachers College, as Cathy mentioned, and I'm a researcher at the Centre for Benefit Class Studies of Education. As George mentioned yesterday, I've spent quite a bit of time over the last two or three years investigating why institutions are offering MOOCs, and perhaps more importantly, whether they are achieving their goals as a result. This morning, I have the pleasure of moderating this panel on MOOC platforms the year ahead. But nonetheless, let me introduce Anand Agarwal, who is the CEO of edX. He's also a professor of electrical engineering and computer science at MIT and an entrepreneur. He's perhaps best known around the world for the first edX MOOC on circuits and electronics, which has also been integrated into a number of on-campus courses at other universities. In England, we'd probably describe Anand as a pleasant, affable chap. And despite the fact he tells me that he is actually an introvert, like myself and Andrina, um, he is probably now known as the public face of ex MOOCs around the world. Then we have Mike, who, uh, Mike Sharples, who we heard from yesterday in the keynote. He is a professor of educational technology at the Open University in the UK. And he's also the academic lead at FutureLearn, which is the UK's online learning platform of note. We heard about that yesterday, that it is a social learning platform, and Mike's own expertise is in the design of learning at scale. Then next we have in the middle, RJ. I've said it almost 40 times now, so I, <laughs> I hope I have it correct. RJ Kapoor, who is the president and CEO of Cadenze. Cadenze is a platform for an online education in the arts and creative technology. As I understand it, RJ started out in the MOOC world about three years ago teaching his own MOOC using an existing platform and became frustrated with the inability to uh, engage the kind of pedagogy he required for teaching the arts. And so, of course, he went and created his own platform. He has an interesting background mix of computer science, engineering, music, and psychology. Have I missed anything, RJ? Okay. Uh, next, we have Andreina Parisiamon from Coursera, who is a teaching and learning specialist there and also the research manager. She, of course, works on course design and on facilitating research using MOOC data, both within Coursera and with outside partners. She is a bioengineer by background, and Coursera, I believe, currently claims to have over 15 million learners and almost 1,500 courses. And at the end, we have Greg Bybee from NovoEd, where he's the director of learning products and solutions. He's a mathematician by background, but he also has an MA in education and an MBA. If you went to Greg's session yesterday, you would have heard that NovoEd is also a social learning platform and places a great deal of emphasis on the use of collaboration and teamwork among participants. So here's how I think the session will run. I have asked each of the panelists to prepare a two to three minute introduction on the key goals for their organization over the next year. After that, I have a series of questions that I've prepared, both my own and from audience members who gave me questions in advance. I do hope to share the, uh, the question time with participants in the audience, but I do ask you, please make questions, questions and save shaggy dog stories and comments to the end if we run out of questions to ask. So I think with that, I'm gonna to move to the end and sit down. And uh, I think we'll start with Anant. Uh, thank you for, uh, if you know, thank you for the introduction and uh, uh, the opportunity to, uh, to have a discussion uh, on this panel. Uh, in terms of uh, the goals for edX over the next, uh, over the next year, um, you know, I like to say that uh, you know, the times are changing. Uh, if you looked at the first phase of uh, MOOCs and online learning as it's done with, uh, with MOOCs, uh, over the past, uh, for us, about four years now, it was really let a thousand flowers bloom. And when we began four years ago, frankly, we had absolutely no idea what we were doing. So uh, uh, we said, let's build a, uh, let's build a platform. Uh, let's uh, create features based on requests from learners and partners. And, See, see what works and what doesn't work. Uh, we didn't take a very prescriptive approach. We, uh, we literally crowdsourced ideas. And uh, one of the key things we did early on was uh, you know, decided to become a nonprofit and open sourced the platform. And frankly, uh, it's interesting, two years ago, uh, the amount of debates that happened in certain quarters as to whether open sourcing was a good idea. 
uh, and uh, uh, open sourcing was simply the best idea that uh, of anything we have ever done. The ecosystem of partners and the ecosystem ex of experimentation has been absolutely mind-boggling. The number of new features that will come in. Um, in this second phase now, uh, you know, I love to call it MOOC uh, 2.0, a number of principles are emerging, and, and I think there'll be a few thrusts as we go ahead, as we've learned quite a bit over the past uh, four years. Uh, on the research front, uh, it was, uh, you know, we shared the data with our partners, it was individual research. Uh, going ahead, it's going to be much more uh, at a group level, and about a couple of months ago, we launched RDX. If it's edX, it's got to have an X. So it's uh, uh, RDX, and RDX stands for Research Data Exchange, which is a, uh, with the edX partners, all the partners now share all of the data in slightly de-identified form. And so this, now it's not just your own data, you can actually request a data from all of the partners and, uh, and uh, do a lot of work, and we're hoping that that'll create a lot more of the group research and collaborative learning using the data ac across the entire partnership. So that's one big theme, which is uh, a group-based, broader sharing. Even on the platform, we're seeing a much, much bigger trend towards uh, uh, the group-based and, uh, and uh, social learning. Uh, as I said before, when we started out, uh, uh, we didn't have a prescription as to how to do things. Should it be purely social? Should it be prescriptive, directive? Um, what we're seeing right now is that you really need a mix. And over the past couple of years, we've invested very heavily and will continue to do so in collaborative and uh, social learning. So for instance, uh, about uh, two months ago, uh, we launched in beta form a concept called Teams. And uh, Teams is being used right now in a course by McGill on edX, uh, in a course on social learning. Uh, teams is a concept on edX today where learners can invite each other and form groups of uh, two, four, five, ten you know, small groups of people by inviting each other. They get a private uh, discussion area. Uh, they uh, can share social personas and things like that. And there'll be more and more features as we add. Professors can give projects, group projects that the small group can do. And so this is one big aspect of this group-wide social learning. Um, so I see the whole social part of learning becoming much, much bigger. The third trend is that in the first four years, everybody was willing to experiment. And, uh, and just uh, you know, uh, not really worry about how do we sustain ourselves. I think going ahead, there'll be a lot more uh, partners are telling us that they're worried more and more about sustainability, <laughs> where even as nonprofits, uh, uh, most of our partners are nonprofit universities, and so are we, but still sustainability is very important. And so uh, coming up with creative ways to, uh, to find a few coins so that we can continue supporting our mission. And so sustainability and features on the platform to support this so one example is uh, we built cohorts on the edX platform. Cohort is a way of creating groupings of people. And so one of the things we can do is create corporate cohorts, where a corporation can pay a fee and get a cohort for all their employees. So there again, that combines both the social and also an ability to, uh, to monetize. So I think three big principles, a lot more group-based research and sharing of data. Uh, I think a lot more social learning through teams. I think uh, a big uh, thrust towards uh, uh, finding ways to monetize both for our partners and for edX. Thank you. Great. Go ahead, Mike. I noted down um, a number of themes that seem to be emerging from this conference in terms of the talks and also the, the talks discussions that I've had over coffee. And they very much <coughs> chime with what you've just said, Anant, and also with the direction that we're taking in future learn. So those themes were social learning, group learning, pedagogy-led design, courses for business and professional development, hybrid and blended learning, and MOOCs for changing society. So some of the ways in which they're being played out in future learn, um, we're recruiting more international partners, uh, as well as uh, university partners, particularly in Asia, but also some in the US. Um, we're recruiting specialist organizations and centers of excellence. So the European Space Agency, the National Film and TV School, Taipei Medical University, Hans Christian Andersen Center in Denmark, centers or, of excellence that have particular specialisms that are world leading. We're also more focused on an what we call the ideal course portfolio, so developing suites of courses in key areas, so digital creativity, in healthcare, and as you might imagine, in language learning. 
and offering collections of courses to learners so that learners can study a, a portfolio of courses in a particular area. <clears throat> and that's going to integrate very interestingly with um, accreditation. So looking at ways in which those portfolios of courses, either from a single institution or multiple institutions, can be accredited, uh, can gain either university credit or um, <coughs> industry credit. <clears throat> We've, uh, some of our current courses have over 50% full participation ones in history, in personal health, in medicine, in education. And our top 20 courses in terms of participation have on average over 45% full participation. So we really want to make more of those courses where learners come and stay till the end of the course. And that's um, a key area that we're looking at, designing courses that people not only want to join but want to keep with. Um, we're developing further in language learning with um, subtitles, extended languages, multiple languages, trying to develop a more internationalized platform. Um, and in terms of the learning experience, as you might imagine, we want to extend our social learning approach, um, and particularly to be able to handle that at massive scale, um, to uh, build on the unexpected um, benefits of having um, in some cases, thousands of people um, comment on the, uh, the content and engage in the discussions. And so finding ways to make the best content uh, that has been provided by the learners rise to the top and to support experiential learning and to support learner-contributed content. Um, we'll be exploring on-demand courses, but in a distinctively future-learn way. I'm not convinced that the... You know, the, the on-demand from other platforms is working, particularly in terms of the social experience. So we'll be looking at on-demand, but in a different way that um, we're trying to keep that, that social engagement. And innovations, um, and Ants mentioned, around group learning and team learning and cohorts. Um, frankly, we're playing catch-up um, with that, with, with FutureLearn, and it's very strongly on our, on our horizons to do that. And um, lastly, around um, verification and verified certificates, so that um, you have uh, elaborated certificates, not just indicating that you've finished the course, but your social profile and your learning profile, and looking at ways in which they can be verified and validated, so that we're moving towards a more blended model, where we're blending uh, and offering benefits back to the partners, so that we're blending MOOC courses into uh, particularly postgraduate degree courses or into industry courses. So those are some of the things we're doing at FutureLearn. Great, thank you. Roger. All right, so we're the baby here. <laughs> uh, our platform launched uh, three months ago. Uh, I'm actually a professor of music technology and digital arts at California Institute of the Arts. I'm actually also an administrator reporting to the president about our digital presence uh, and our strategy. Uh, and I'm also a student and have taken a course on everyone's platform here. Uh, and now, unfortunately, I run a MOOC. And there is a huge problem. And I come from to this with um, wanting to represent a set of students, a set of teachers that have been uh, left out of the conversation. Um, first of all, college in the US is getting completely insanely out of control. And it's one thing if you're studying engineering, it's one thing if you're studying business, it's one thing if you're studying to be a medical doctor. But if you are going to college to learn how to be a dancer, an artist, a musician, and paying $200,000 to go to college, it is completely insane because you do not make that type of money at the end uh, of your degree. And it's not like, wow, there's all these amazing new positions for, for these artists. And the culture of a country, a culture of our society is at risk. And if this continues, basically the word art and the word college will never be in the same sentence. So what we have set out to do is actually use all of the 
stand on the shoulders of, of everyone on this stage and build a MOOC that actually moves towards awarding credit. So when we launched in June, we launched with 18 partners. Half of our courses actually convert to real college credit at 75% off of what it costs on campus. And we think this is really important and is necessary in the arts field in order to keep the doors open uh, of these art colleges. Uh, and I also believe in order to accomplish this goal, we needed to design a system that was specifically geared towards our type of pedagogy. Taking a platform that's built for engineering, taking a platform that's built for math, and then trying to fit arts pedagogy into this platform actually is very limiting. You have to make design decisions from the very beginning about what you need to do uh, to create these type of open learning platforms. Uh, so that's why we had to start from scratch and uh, build Cadenze. Thank you. Uh, so at Coursera, one of our core values is learners first. And so as we think about what we've done, as well as we look towards the future, it's all about understanding who is our learner, how are we helping them, and how can we better help them in building towards that. So uh, the learner outcome survey, which some of you may have read, uh, that came out last week, went really far in helping us understand the impact that we, with our partners, have been able to have thus far um, in terms of asking learners, what were your goals when you came to the platform, and did you meet them? Did you get any outcomes? And we found that um, learners are getting outcomes, both tangible in terms of career and educational, as well as intangible outcomes. And so we want to keep building towards that. Um, last month, we launched 32 career-relevant specializations that were built specifically with our learners in mind in terms of content strategy around what they've been asking for and pedagogy in terms of how to teach specifically to them that we've been working with our partners. And so as we look to the year ahead, we're going to be continuing in this content strategy direction of researching and understanding in the market what are learners looking for when they come to the platform and then giving that information sharing with our partners to say, you know, which of these are in your area of expertise that you want to be creating courses around and then how can we help you create courses that are well suited for learners that are coming to learn on the platform. Um, additionally, we're looking at novel deliveries and ways to take MOOCs even further. So an example of this is the IMBA program from Illinois that has recently launched. And so how can you take MOOCs to then move towards credit, to move towards um, that, that full MBA in this case, um, building off of what is on the platform? Uh, and so how can we bring, take that further? Are there other ways to uh, move MOOCs into universities that can help learners or into companies that can help uh, people that are there, uh, as well as building the platform in a way that continues to look at what's the pedagogy that's missing, what are we learning about who these learners are, and how do we build a platform that helps all of our partners teach better through that, um, as well as using the data not only of what learners say they want, but how they actually act when they come to the platform to be quickly iterating uh, so that it's a really sticky and useful place for them. And then finally, really looking to go and meet our learners where they are, not just in how they're getting their courses, but internationally. And so uh, we recently did a Spanish launch with a focus on Latin America with 100 new courses that are available in Spanish. And we're looking to continue diving deeper into what is the content that is needed uh, outside of the US and all over the world so that we can really bring that to the learners that are coming to the platform. So NovoEd's mission is to make online learning more effective and engaging. And we believe the way to do that is to look at offline education and what works really well. And so we think about small uh, workshops, entrepreneurship labs, discussion forums, case-based uh, business school courses. And we're trying to replicate that sort of pedagogy, the peer-to-peer -peer constructivist learning online. And so to think about where we're going, it's a bit helpful to think about where we've come from and over the past two or three years, have really worked on building up a true social learning platform. So it starts with discussions. I think that's the, the core of social. But it's much more than that. As we heard, you really have to have meaningful discussions. And so we were built around collaboration around shared projects. 
So we have a, a team workspace where people can come together and work on Google Documents, on live Hangouts, on synchronous discussions. And then from these projects, you create user-generated content. And so our platform is really built around sharing and discovery of each other's content. And so beyond the formal part of the course, that's only about 10 to 20% of the actual learning and content. The remaining 80 to 90% comes from the peers. And then there's a rich uh, discussion around informal and formal feedback through not just peer evaluation, but also commenting and voting and liking and different mechanisms to share feedback. We also build in coaching and mentorship from previous students, from teaching assistants, uh, from community catalysts, and from the instructors. And all of this is focused around building a learning community, so around engendering felt accountability, a social obligation between peers. And what I talked about in my talk yesterday was really how this accountability is what drives intrinsic motivation and drives our completion rates in learning uh, very high. So as we're moving forward, we're starting to think about you know, if we've taken this type of online, offline learning and scale it online, well, now we're thinking about bringing that back. And so we're hearing a lot of interest in hybrid learning, about blending the online and the offline, uh, both in universities as well as in corporations. How can we be both a pre and post, and how can we extend the learning beyond the workshop or the in-person class uh, into a community of practice and into a community of learning? Uh, a second big focus for us has been around analytics and data. And so actually in the past two months, we launched our second, you know, our new analytics platform, and we're continuing to build out APIs and different ways for data exchange. Uh, a third area of focus for us is internationalization and mobile. So Novo is already mobile compatible, but now we're working on a really high quality, high end, um, fully mobile optimized experience because we're seeing a lot of the international users um, aren't switching back and forth. We designed it that you would be half off, half on, half off mobile. And now we're designing it so you can do everything completely on mobile device. A fourth area that's coming up is around programs. So we've also moved to having multi-course programs and we're seeing a need for additional services around that. So around marketing, around online program management. And so Novo is actually building out our services to really be a, a full solution provider for our partners. And the final theme that we've been thinking about is sort of maybe the, the flip of, of some of the other MOOCs is going from how do we go from mass scale social? We've, that's where we started, was how do we take a group of 100,000 and break it into what feels like groups of 10 and 20? Um, and now we're thinking about, well, how do we actually achieve that on a smaller scale? How can we make a class of 20, uh, whether it be at a community college or be it a, at a large company, how can we make sure that's a very high quality social experience when you don't have the same scale? So we're also considering the self-paced is an area that we get a lot of questions around and we're not yet sure if our model will work as well uh, in a self-paced paradigm, but that's definitely something we're thinking a lot about. Great. Thank you very much for that introduction. Is that working, the mic? Okay. Great, okay, so in terms of the questions, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to direct the question first to one person, um, who I thought about who I wanted to do that before, and then uh, after that person's made their comments, if anyone else would like to speak to it, please do so, but the first person has to take the first shot. So Anant, I'm going to start with you. <laughs> uh, if a potential partner comes to you asking about what they should be doing in online learning in general, what are you currently advising them? So if a partner comes to us saying, uh, you know, uh, what should we be doing in that space in online learning, and they haven't done a whole lot, uh, you know, it's two words, get cracking. <laughs> um, you know, I really, I really believe that the future of learning is blended, that education is not going to be the same, uh, you know, in 10 years. Universities are not going to be the same in 10 years. And I think what's really important is nobody knows the answers as to where universities and education is going to be in 10 years or 20 years. But what's really, really important is to be in that sandbox, is to be playing out there. And by playing out there, when jewels show up, you will be there to grab them. And if you're not playing in that playground, you're sitting off on the sidelines, you will miss the boat. And so it's two simple words, get cracking. And, and we try to find many ways in which people can try to uh, uh, get going in online education. We've created a number of uh, uh, MOOCs on how to create the blended model of learning, how to create online courses. Also with the open source platform, today uh, uh, we have uh, uh, several hundred open source uh, edX adoption sites all over the world 
that are experimenting with online learning, even though we can't bring them all on edX. Uh, you know, as our partners, we have about 100 partners today, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, hundreds more around the world. Uh, we have 700 courses on edX, but uh, uh, to what we could count, there's 1,800 courses on open edX sites, and I'm told that there's probably uh, an order of magnitude more that we don't know about. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, last week, uh, Russia launched uh, a national online platform, uh, the Minister of Education did, using open edX. It's called openedu.ru. And so nations, so it's not just partners, but <clears throat> countries are coming to us saying, what should we do? And we say, go play. You know, you go launch the platform. And you have no excuse to say that you don't have infrastructure. Here's the code. Here's software. And you know what? It's free. Take it. Experiment with it. So I think that's the key. Get cracking. Experiment. And uh, you know, we don't know what the answers are, but uh, you need to be playing in the sandbox. Great, thank you. Anybody else want to comment on that? So, so actually it's really funny because for art schools, like the idea of using an LMS at all to <coughs> communicate even on campus is actually, believe it or not, still in question, uh, which is completely insane. Um, but I think there's two types of schools. There's the small school that, you know, I agree just needs to jump in and, and, and learn how to get involved. But the bigger schools, I actually, tell them, and good thing the people from my company aren't here, I actually tell them that actually don't just work with one company. You have to work with multiple companies because everyone has a different strategy, everyone has a different platform, everyone has a different audience, and actually none of us know what we're doing. And we, we need to be involved and see which one works and how it actually affects um, the future of, of you know, what's going to happen in three years. Right, Mike? I absolutely agree that the future is in blended or hybrid learning and that every university, college, even school is going to get into this area within the next five to ten years. There are different sorts of blending. So there's blending campus and online, there's blending free and paid for, there's blending accredited and non-accredited, there's blending um, self-directed and tutorial. Mike and tutorial supported. Um, so I think we need to explore this space, not just of online and campus, but other sorts of blending. So for instance, at the Open University, we have uh, a model that's been going for over 40 years now of supported open learning, where you get tutorial support. So in some ways, you get the advantages of online learning, but you also get the advantage of the Oxford and Cambridge model of having small group tutorial support. Um, so we've got to look at other ways of blending. It will work for some institutions to have that sort of uh, online support. Uh, for others, it will be a matter of trying to blend courses from a number of different providers um, and provide uh, added value or accreditation to them. So it's a huge space of possibilities, and you know, we're really playing in this space. And over the next five years, I think we'll discover which models work for which sorts of institutions. The one thing I would add, I think it's very important to, to jump in and experiment to, um, yeah, kind of break that in, initial barrier. But I think what's gonna be really important for institutions is to identify as quickly as possible what their differentiation is, what their area of specialization. Uh, I think there's a risk of people jumping in and putting up a lot of classes and just becoming one of the now thousands of universities providing free online courses. And so we really work with our partners to think about what can you do different or better than anyone else? What, what business model can you come up with? What courses can you teach? So University of Iowa, big focus on creative writing. Uh, Stanford GSB did a couple of MOOCs to test things out, but then honed in on this LEAD program. Um, University of Virginia Darden is really focusing on design and innovation and creating small paid classes that they can then replicate across companies. So I think that would be my, my additional piece of advice is find where you can be different from everyone else. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, a lot of echoing, but um, one extra piece is what was discussed in the opening remarks in terms of really thinking about who is your learner. So when you're jumping on a platform, whichever platform it is that you're deciding to, to play with and to move into this online space, it's to really think about, you know, you're teaching a set of students on campus, and then how are you taking that an extra step and really building for the learner that's coming to you online? Okay. Does anyone in the audience have a question that's specifically about this topic as to what you should be doing in online learning? 
I'll give you other opportunities to ask questions on other topics. I'm curious, uh, a lot of institutions uh, have you know, online learning for their residential programs, right? The, so they're running an LMS like Canvas or Blackboard. And when I talk to CIOs, they're always scratching their head, like, how, what is the Venn diagram? Like, why, how do I think about Canvas versus, you know, edX? I'm a consortium member. I'm running courses there. How do, you know, I have these residential courses. I have exec ed. I have, um, you know, maybe some pre-matriculation courses, preparatory for students incoming. And I have different online programs. So how do I, so, I've, you know, I've got cracking. I've jumped in. I've got all these different you know, platforms, the content is not easily portable between them. How do I think about online learning um, in this kind of balkanized world? Anand, go ahead. Eager. Um, I, think the, uh, I think the answer is, uh, was contained in sort of what Mike uh, Sharples said, is that the funny part is the answer is not here or here, uh, it's going to be blended. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the way to think about it is if you look at uh, campus uh, platforms, whether it's Sakai or Blackboard or Canvas or any of them, they have a set of mechanisms that are very particularized uh, for campus LMSs. And at one point, uh, uh, many, many partners have asked us, look, can you make uh, open edX more like a campus LMS so we could use it all over campus? But uh, I think the open edX community will get there in three to five years, but it's not there. And so right now, the strategy is blended, which is, uh, you can use both, uh, let's say, for content and uh, interactives and for fun stuff. Uh, you use a MOOC platform. And, uh, and for a lot of the campus management, uh, grades and integration into SIS and so on, use Blackboard or Canvas. And, uh, and we've, we've, we've spent a lot of effort with our open source partners. I know um, Harvard and University of Queensland, John Zornig is here. Uh, they worked really hard to do uh, an incredible integration uh, using LTI uh, with Blackboard, Canvas, and others so that you can, uh, content can now interoperate between Canvas and edX. And University of British Columbia is doing a huge pilot where co content playing on edX can now be played through Canvas with using edX as a tool provider, and similarly vice versa. So I think the key is portability and, uh, and interoperability through standards like uh, LTI or XBlox and so on. So I don't think it has to be one or the other. And the key is uh, really unbundling and blending. <coughs> Before um, the MOOCs came along, there was a, a progression on campus platforms away from VLEs towards <coughs> PLEs, personal learning environments. And you know, it's not just a difference in terminology, there's a fundamental distinction. PLEs are based around the learner rather than around the course. And the idea is that the learner is at the center, and the learner already has uh, a uh, ecosystem, to, to use a phrase, um, an ecosystem of different sorts of um, technologies that they work with. So they may be working with uh, mobile, they may be working with um, social network um, uh, tools uh, and uh, social network uh, environments. And the idea behind PLEs is that you provide a way of aggregating all of these, of putting the learner at the center and using those for the benefit of learning, not only for um, the social um, networking. And so what is now happening that MOOCs come along is that they fit into that um, ecosystem. So the learner is still at the center, but as well as being able to access various other tools and resources, they can also access MOOC courses or MOOC content, so disaggregating the content from MOOCs that they can use on campus courses. So at the Open University, our main platform is Moodle. And, we're comp uh, and as far as I know, we're probably the biggest user of Moodle worldwide at the Open University. And we're completely redesigning the Moodle platform so that not only is it going to be responsive, so it can be um, used on mobile devices, it's going to be learner-centered. So that we're not assuming you've got to do everything on the platform, it's going to link out through LTI to many different other tools and resources. So it's becoming much more learner-focused rather than course-focused. Okay, I'm going to shift um, a little bit to design features at the moment. I'm going to start with uh, Andrina. You have a course design background. So can you tell us what specifically has changed in terms of MOOC design since 2011-12? 
And um, RJ, maybe you could follow up with telling us how your platform is accommodating things like the arts in terms specifically of design. We've heard a lot about social learning, so let's talk about some actual sort of pedagogical strategies. Sure. Um, so at the risk of sounding like a broken record, <laughs> I think one of the biggest things that has come out is really this question around who is your learner. So when we started creating MOOCs, I think there was a big focus on what are we teaching in the classroom and then how do we get that out at scale and so it was a lot more of transferring what was in the classroom and how it was taught there into an online platform and a different way of accessing it and now I think there's a different way of approaching the learning and so really thinking about um, what is how do you want your learner to be different after they have taken your course what are the concrete skills that you want them to have at that point and then what are the pieces that you're building up to it. Um, one of the big differences of learners that are on the platform versus on campus are that um, it's more difficult for someone to leave a lecture hall than it is to leave your lecture video that they're watching. And so how do you really condense down the knowledge that you're trying to say? We talk about shorter videos and it's not so much just about hoping that keeping it short will keep people around long enough that they reach the end, but that you're really condensing down that information into the key points that they need to be learning and then very quickly giving them a way to practice and get feedback and, and be building those skills that then they can go and use tomorrow uh, in their workplace with their families in their lives. Okay, RJ, what so, do you do that's different? Well, what I did for 15 years before I, again, unfortunately had to build a MOOC uh, is I actually strangely built robots that play music with humans um, and that's really strange. And there's, uh, I built an orchestra that had 20 robots that, a lot of them that lived in the audience and could figure out what 10 <laughs> humans on stage were doing and then actually intelligently interact, uh, whatever that means. Uh, but with that skill and with that team, we were able to actually build uh, systems that actually go beyond text auto assessment and actually start creating tools that can assess and we started with music because that's what we're good at um, and you know be it, students can submit music assignments and we can tell you what tempo what key how many sections and things like that are in the songs and so coming up and a, a big problem with putting arts education online is that you know, when you, when you have a computer science class, it's, it's awesome because there are all these auto assessment things that um, these platforms have, uh, which are amazing. So you get immediate feedback and then you can go to another assignment and there's peer assessment. So you get this like blended experience where you're, you're learning from your peers, but you're also getting immediate feedback. In the arts, you know, we were focused only on peer assessment. And that's like, honestly, that's not good enough. Uh, and that's why we started building these tools. Uh, and that's a big part of, of what Cadenze has developed over the last three years. You want to say something? Mm -hmm. So say two things come to mind. One is, we used to think about what, is, what are the learning objectives and backwards designing from what do we want the learners to learn? And now we're thinking more, what do we want the learners to do in the course? And so we actually design it such that you achieve your objective during the course of the class. So for an example, we have a course on writing your first novel. And the learning objective is not, or the objective is not to learn how to get started, to come up with your idea, to outline. No, 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 the, the goal of the course is to write your first chapter. Uh, we have classes on design thinking, where the goal is not to learn to use the process, the goal is to have yeah. used the process to change something you're working on your day-to-day -day job. So focusing on what do we want the learner to achieve and to do has been a, a big transition. And the second, I, I agree with understanding the learner. And I'll say one thing is we've, we've been humbled and realized we don't understand the learner as much as we want to, and so it's been a reliance more on data. So on A-B testing, on trying, on iterating different things, and really leveraging the data um, to make design decisions. Can I actually add one okay. thing to that point? Um, 
I think another piece of it is how quickly can you iterate on the course that you have created. So, you know, we're talking a lot about thinking in advance of what is needed uh, to teach or to get learners to be able to do specific things, um, but we're continuously learning who that is and, and how they work. And so being able to give data quickly back to partners on this question was really hard, people were really confused, this video didn't make sense to them, uh, and having a platform that's flexible enough to, to allow them to iterate quickly on pieces of their courses with the time that they're able to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Alan actually yeah. wants to say something. So but very quickly, I think, uh, um, certainly I think a focus on learners is very important and uh, we try to do that. But one of the priorities we made, uh, and maybe we were a bit unique in that, is really focus on the teacher. And the reason we felt that was important to do early on in the game was if, it, if you don't make it easy for instructors and teachers <coughs> to be able to author just absolutely spectacular content, to be creative and to create new experiences, new types of content, new pedagogies, then, then nothing really matters. And if you can't attract great teachers to really experiment to do fun things, uh, then you know, a lot of this is coming from teachers. And so you want to understand the learner, but really be teacher-centric as well. So we did a lot of work in the platform, um, and with our open source partners in particular, to create just an extraordinarily rich set of problem types available um, in standard form in the platform. And many of them are not built by edX, but with the partners, drag and drop, drop exercises, image responses where you can circle images. And just uh, yesterday morning, I spoke with the MIT team that now has a sketch response. We can, we, believe it or not, we can actually, learners can sketch an answer and, uh, and the computer can grade it. Uh, it. And they used it in the calculus course. So I'd love to see that on the platform. And so really create a, a, a plethora of very interesting and exciting problem types. Um, and that can also address the criticism of MOOC platform, which is that, oh, they're useless, they're good for vocational training, they're all about videos and multiple choice. No. We need to get teachers and universities excited about giving credit. We want them to use it on campus to improve campus learning. If all we're providing is videos and multiple choice, it is boring. It will die. We have to create great ways of authoring content that people and professors and teachers can use it in schools and colleges to improve the campus experience, not to devolve the campus experience. So we had a huge focus on being able to author great content, enabling professors and teachers to, to do A-B testing, not from on the platform sense, but in content. So today, with ease, a professor can very easily create an A-B test where the platform will randomize students into multiple pathways through a course, where a professor can decide, oh my god, it's so much easier and better to teach this concept through text rather than using videos. And so turn instructors and teachers into engineers who can continually improve education. So we felt that putting a significant focus on the teacher was extremely important, both from our development and also from a community development. Okay, Mike, I know you want to say something, so I'm going to ask you a question that leads on from this, and you can say what you were going to say anyway as, as part of it. <laughs> Possibly. You can fit it in somehow. Okay, so within a single platform, uh, such as you're uh, working with, are there some specific design features that make some MOOCs more successful than others in terms of persistence, completion, and uh, student achievement? Actually, it does link into what I was going to say, <laughs> <laughs> which is the design process, because I wanted to talk about the design process. Uh, and there's um, a well-tried method um, uh, in education technology of design-based research. And in design-based research, you, it's an iterative process, and you run a series of design experiments where you have an, uh, a, a notion that comes from either learning theory or from previous practical work on what might work in terms of improvements to the platform, but also to the pedagogy, to the learning experience. And then you carry out a design experiment. Um, so you implement something on the platform and you then do a test to see if that works. And there are various sorts of tests, obviously, in terms of learning process, learning outcomes to see if it works. And then you learn from that process. And it's an iterative process. And the great thing about MOOCs is you can do it rapidly and at scale. Um, you can perform very quick design experiments. So some of the things we've found on the platform that are really making a difference is in terms of the, the learning design, the way in which the courses are structured. 
So just to give you one example, at the very beginning, um, when we set out with FutureLearn, we had a whole series of introductory steps. We call them steps on FutureLearn. So typically on a course, it would be an introduction to the educators, an introduction to the course, how to study uh, on FutureLearn. And by the time you got down to the interesting things, you'd be four or five steps in and we'd lost half of the people. So we completely restructured around starting with the learner's experience. So, for instance, on the uh, Understanding IELTS course, the first step would be, what's your experience of doing an exam? Uh, and what's your experience of learning English? And then take that uh, as uh, a way of uh, introducing learners then to the content. Well, how can you improve your exam technique? Um, how can you enhance your experience of English? So we've redesigned the courses based on that design-based research approach of using analytics both within the course, very rapid feedback, but also at the end of each course, providing transcripts back to the, the educators, to the course designers, so that they can then improve the next run of the course. So I think that's the main thing that we've been doing. We've been redesigning the structure of courses based on these design experiments. Great, thanks. So I'm going to ask if the audience has any questions that are specific to the topic of design in MOOCs, and then I want to move on to the topic of costs and financing free education. Anyone have a question about design? Lady over here. Thank you. I'd love to hear more about um, from Ajay about arts. And, you know, um, arts is such an embodied practice in teaching painting and dance, and I really appreciate your call for creating MOOCs that can help teach that and make it accessible. And yet, I wonder if you're meeting up against the limits of peer assessment, given a certain kind of virtuosity and given a certain kind of embodied practice in, in some of the arts. Um, so I just would love to hear you talk about how you're conceptualizing that or what you're thinking about in terms of scaling up for other kinds of arts beyond music. So the first thing I say when I'm talking to administrators or a school is that only, and if we're lucky, maybe only 10% of what is taught on an arts campus can actually be put into a platform uh, at the MOOC level. And that's really those foundational <laughs> courses, um, little snippets of like theory, history, um, and uh, these ideas where you're learning um, about historical practice but then being uh, not forced, but hopefully urged to actually create something in that type of context um, and setting up a, a system where, you know, students can learn and share uh, from those type of experiences. And really the goal, and it actually comes back to a question from the gentleman over there who, when, when we're having these conversations, if your CIO is the only person in the room, already the t school doesn't understand because your marketing team needs to be there, your admissions team needs to be there. Um, this is, a MOOC is much more than just a learning platform. It is literally a, a marketing experience to show people how amazing your campus is uh, and get them excited like Anant was saying and being like, wow, learning's really fun and you, you should see how cool this is on our campus and actually then come to uh, to campus and actually do all the impossible things that you know will never be online and shouldn't be online if that makes sense so it's really like a door opening uh, to say hey you should really come and and learn here and actually hey you weren't considering like a creative college degree and actually maybe you should okay do you have a quick question here uh, I'm interested in what happens when you find yourself having to say to a teacher that you can't do that. Uh, sometimes when I've heard, in, so I teach a MOOC and have designed one, um, sometimes I've heard we can't do that and it means that would take a huge amount of engineering time and effort and we can't right now. Sometimes it means that's impossible. So I'd like to hear some of you talk about the can't because Granted, at a s learning with MOOCs too, it's all going to be about can, and there's a lot of idealism in that. So let's talk, particularly following from Anant's suggestion that the, this has got to be teacher-centered, and teachers have lots of ideas, and we just heard that only 10% of the arts can be accommodated, so that sounds like 90% is a can't. I'd like to know more about can't. <laughs> 
Okay, Anand, why don't you give a swift answer to that and then sure, I want to move on. Sure. The most dangerous word to uh, say to an engineer is can't. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so as engineers, when we started edX four years ago, I was told we couldn't do a bunch of things. And our team just, and, and the open source community went above and beyond and did all kinds of cool stuff. So I would simply say, give me the list of things that people say you can do it, and we have two answers. One is that, yep, it can be done, but if I put it on the roadmap. And the second thing is, in a lot of cases, uh, including the sketching tool from MIT, they came and said, look, we want to do this. We didn't say it can't be done. We said it can't be done. It's open source. Go do it. And you know what? They went and did it. And then they'll give it back to the community, and we all benefit. So I think the key answer is just enabling people to do it and tell them, you go do it. And so uh, but that's the way to do it. <laughs> Makes it sound very easy, but we're not all MIT engineers. <laughs> <laughs> I also think, like, actually, there's, I, I think we need to define what a MOOC is, which maybe is the point of, of this conference. Um, but there's this idea of the self-paced, <coughs> you know, massive amount of people being open and free uh, that you can come to at any time. And then there's this other category of, like, a smaller, type of courses which our platforms are also helping facilitate. Um, when, when there's this idea of giving feedback directly from the teacher to every individualized um, student, you can certainly do that, but that's changing uh, you know, what this is. Like, can you do that for 10,000 people? Uh, and that's a different type of question. So it's like, it's a different design problem of, of what you're trying to solve and what the goals are. And actually the cost and the business models for those type of things, you know, can go from free to maybe something that costs more money, if that makes sense. Great, thanks for the segue. All right, so I'm going to direct this question first at, at Greg here. So um, we know that there's a, a wide range of estimates of the cost of developing a move. What do you tell potential developers who want to use your platform they should be thinking about in terms of the resource requirements, not necessarily the sticker price, but the time, effort, and, and money that goes into it? And do you have any strategies you suggest to them about how to cover those MOOC-related costs? The cost can vary a lot from ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 for a webcam and a little bit of instructional design time to several hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, we found the sweet spot is not in spending on video. Uh, it's really on spending the money and time on instructional design. Mm -hmm. And so we think it does take several months of you know, backwards planning and design to, to build a really high quality MOOC. And so it can vary from fifty dollars to $100,000. Um, we have a, a team, I think something that makes Novoad very unique is our instructional design team um, really focuses on helping our partners move from offline to online, <coughs> help them design a course from scratch. And we have more educators on staff and more instructional designers than engineers at NovoEd. It's a, it's a big focus for us to help our partners think about pedagogy, think about how they can differentiate. Um, so we also provide, we have a course on NovoEd on how to, how to build a course on NovoEd. And we provide, we have a kind of a step-by-step -step process that we walk our partners through to help them think about how can you differentiate, how can you design that? Um, how much should we spend on, on video production? We have a, a video production you know, sort of contract agency we work with that we can help uh, connect our partners to. Um, we have instructional design resources to help. So we're very sort of full solution, hands-on in the process. OK, I still don't know how people are supposed to cover those costs. But let me oh. just um, move, well, you can think about that. But <laughs> I want to ask um, AJ in particular, because RJ, sorry. Went back to my previous 40 times <laughs> of practicing that pronunciation. RJ, OK. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in this idea that you are uh, offering credit at 75% discount. Mm -hmm. um, so are those credits really cheaper to deliver, or is somebody subsidizing them? I, I don't, as I, I'm still really puzzled by this idea of offering education, which is a really expensive endeavor, mm -hmm. uh, free or low cost. Some, mm -hmm. Someone's paying for it somewhere. Right. Who is that and how? So I think, you know, I think we heard yesterday that the, uh, the, the price for developing these was 35K to 300K, someone said, which is crazy to me. Um, the, and I, I agree, it is actually really expensive. Um, we've had to first, to get the art schools involved, we've centralized, um, similar to uh, what Novoed's doing, where um, we have a, 
a team of instructional designers and filmmakers, actually. Uh, being in LA, we uh, were very easily be able to find those. Um, and what we've done is create a centralized hub where we're learning from all of our partners about how their success stories um, in building online courses and by actually creating them for, for the schools. Um, we are the, the new person, the new school who's never thought of this, we're able to get you know, all this knowledge from the schools who've invented it, if that makes sense, and kind of pass that information through, uh, which is really important. Um, the idea is, and, and this is what I was talking about before, it's like there's multiple types of education. I mean, you as educators, think about it. What you teach in the first year on campus you have like two to three to 400 people in your classes at some big schools, and then it comes down to like 20 or 30 people, you know, uh, at, at the fourth year. You can't tell me that that is the same thing. That is completely different. And it's the same thing with what you can do with online education. The, these foundational type of courses um, can be put up online, and they can actually cost less. And you can get more people to learn these, these foundation years and then bring them onto campus or bring them onto another type of online experience that is more one-on-one -on -one with a teacher where you get one-on-one -on -one feedback. Um, so the idea is by putting your course uh, up on any of the platforms that you actually end up paying for credit, and I know there's a multiple things going on here uh, with ASU and with um, the MBA program, which we're super stoked about, um, it's, it's really important because you're able to, like imagine when Apple came out with the App Store and it was like, wow, you can buy a piece of software for a dollar? Like that's insane. And then millions of people started buying these things for, for a dollar. And now by putting credit up on, on the, on essentially education app stores, <laughs> uh, it's, you know, and lowering the price, you know, we're giving access to people who want to get an education who never actually <laughs> ever would consider about it because the sticker price is too high. I mean, if you look at it, the, the world population, only 3% of the world population as of 2010 went to college. That's, that's insane. Okay, so it's this, the MOOC aspect of giving the information is one thing, but actually now starting to give credit is, is really important. Did you want to follow up? Yeah, right. sorry, sorry, I forgot the second part of your question. Um, so NovoEd's a bit different than some of the other MOOC platforms because only about 20 to 30% of our courses are actually free. Um, that is to say we do offer a large number of free courses to the public, but what we see happens is um, learners in that course will love the course and want to bring it back into their company. So we have examples of strategic decision group. Uh, someone from Unilever took their course and then brought that course into their organization and paid you know, a, a good amount of money that more than covered the cost. Um, from University of Virginia, we've had uh, NASDAQ and AB InBev and NASA and others essentially license that course privately within their organization. And so that's been one of the best ways to recoup and actually in many cases it's become a sustainable business model uh, is by offering it free and then a few people in that course will want to take it in a private group. Okay. Um, no. um, Maurice, I'm looking at you. Five minutes? Okay, great. All right, does anyone want to? Yeah, can I just add to that? Uh, so I think uh, one piece that was brought up was this idea of scale. And so even if you are, um, in our case, it's certificates. And so when learners find the value high enough that they want to be able to show that to other, they're purchasing certificates that can go from 29 to I think the highest now is, is 99, which seems very small. But when you hit the scale that we're at, can in fact help recoup those costs. Uh, but Fiona, I think you made a really good point about where is the money coming from originally to be able to even get to that point. And so one of the things that we've started doing is having a proposal proposal process for specializations and being able to help front some of those in advances that then um, we and the institutions are expecting to get back when learners are in those courses. And so this is a really real consideration and concern. And so as you're thinking about how to save money, it's also where does that money come from originally. OK, great. Mike, quickly, and then if the audience has any last questions. Chris, I know you had one. And Furkan, you said you had one. So the benefits from an institutional perspective, at the OU we had a meeting last week, a high level meeting about what are 
the tangible and not so tangible benefits of engaging in MOOCs. And we came up with about 20 um, items. I'm not going to remember them all, but the main ones were firstly brand awareness. So you know, we can calculate at the Open University the value of each viewing of our logo in terms of a fraction of a penny. And when you've got millions of people viewing your logo then around the world, then that brings back tangible benefits. Secondly, recruitment onto particularly master's courses, but also undergraduate courses, so feed through from MOOCs onto our paid for courses. Um, thirdly, it hasn't been mentioned research benefits. So uh, we're getting substantial research um, income now from doing um, learning analytics, big data analysis, predictive analytics. So we're gaining research benefits back from um, our engagement with MOOCs. Um, Mike, and, who's paying for those? Hmm? Who's Sorry? paying for that research? Euro Europe. Um, so <laughs> the, the European Commission, um, the UK research councils, and also industry. We're getting uh, industrial sponsorship of research. Um, and the other main benefit is innovation. So you know, the Open University has to innovate. Um, and because we're now competing worldwide in the way that we weren't before, and MOOCs are an opportunity for us to innovate, we actually run five learning platforms. So FutureLearn is just one of um, learning platforms we run. All of those are, you know, we, we run a platform called OpenLearn with five million people on it. So we are you know, using all of these platforms for, for innovation uh, and feeding back to our core courses. So those are some of the benefits direct and indirect benefits that we get back from engaging with MOOCs. That's great. OK, I'm going to let uh, Chris ask this question. So this is a question for everyone, because I know we're all trying to have these innovative uh, <coughs> pedagogical design features and all this social learning. But how do you conform to the, world, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines Level AA standard when you're also trying to de design these social interaction and all of this innovative pedagogy like the like the new math tool that you mentioned or not. I don't know if anybody has anything else similar going on, but. So we've, <clears throat> so at edX, uh, we've committed uh, publicly to, uh, to making uh, our platform and site uh, WCAG 2.0 AA um, uh, accessible. And probably uh, just beyond the pale in terms of how much we're doing for accessibility. Uh, we've also created an internal MOOC on accessibility training for software developers, instruction designers, and so on. And uh, you know, there's a lot of pressure on us to make that a MOOC. But we have to first make sure that course itself is accessible. <laughs> and uh, and, uh, and making, making the platform and the course accessible <laughs> is extremely expensive, but extremely important. And we are totally committed to doing that. And you won't believe uh, how many things you can make accessible. And uh, the key is by having a text overlay to a lot of the content. Um, that, that, that provides a description of what you're doing. Um, and it's amazing, once, once, at least for me it was an epiphany, once you do that, uh, it's an easy path to uh, you know, meeting the basic standards of accessibility. But I think it's very critical for online learning and MOOC platforms to really push very hard in this direction, and WCAG 2.0 AA is, is, uh, is a good, uh, good threshold. It's actually a requirement from certain schools that we all are compliant, so we actually had to launch six months later so that we could deal with that problem, but it's actually the most amazing thing that a school forced us to do that um, because we opened correctly, if that makes sense. Yeah. And it's exactly the same with FutureLearn. We're um, the same uh, AA compliance, and we've had to put a lot of effort into doing it. And also, you know, accessibility in the other way of, um, for instance, uh, at the moment in China, there are issues with um, accessibility, access to videos. And so we're looking at different methods of streaming videos to China so that we can give the same experience around the world. OK, so just as a wrap up, Furkan, did you want to ask your question? The, the life cycle of MOOCs, and you know, there was the, um, the peak of inflation, and then you're in the uh, you know, trough of despair. Uh, they're, they're, they never show the path that goes you know, down and, uh, to uh, the uh, termination. But uh, there's the, you know, the curve back. So where are we at on that curve? Uh, and, and how do we know? We're there, and and what do we need to do to make sure we get to the uh, plateau of enlightenment? Okay, we don't have time to answer all of those questions. Why doesn't each one person here just say very quickly where they think we're on that cycle? Anand. 
So I think we've come out of the depths of despair. There are lots and lots <laughs> of articles in, uh, mm. on cheating in MOOCs and uh, disaster and all of that stuff. And I think the hard work is happening now. And if you look at uh, uh, continued dramatic increasing enrollments and so on, so I think we are headed on the plateau towards, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, finding the value uh, in MOOCs and, uh, and continued progress. Great. Mike? We're on a journey, um, and MOOCs are one stage on that journey. Probably in five years' time, we've, we may not be talking about MOOCs, but we will be talking about blended learning, hybrid learning, integrating online and free and uh, paid for, and particularly integrating accreditation. So I think we're, we're moving towards something which is more complex, but also going to be more valuable and more sustainable. RJ? I think that the last 20 years has been a beta test of the internet in general. <laughs> with the idea of only 3 billion people online right now and when 5G comes out and when Elon Musk and all these other people give actually internet to the world for free, um, that's when things are really going to get out of beta. Andrina? Uh, I'd say we're right between the slope of enlightenment and on our way to that plateau of productivity. Mm -hmm. There's continued funding that's going out, so people are still believe in this. Um, there is evidence of real tangible outcomes that have come from this, and so I think that that's getting us um, up that slope. Uh, but we still have a lot of questions around what are the right metrics of success and how are we going to make this more mainstream and adopted, and so that's what we're going to need before we can be in full productivity mode. Great. Thank you. Great. Last word. And I, I agree with Ajay. I think we in the room are really sort of on the Rogers bell curve, the innovators, the early adopters. And the late majority is still at the very beginning of that curve. Mm. And so we're seeing new learners come on and new people moving onto the internet and becoming aware of this. And so I think we're still very early in the journey. Mm. Great. Thank you so much. Please can we thank you. Mm. Mm.